This is Arsecast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra, as always, with James from Gunnerblog slash The Athletic. James, goodly morning and congratulations to you on your new gig. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's exciting. I'm really happy to be doing it and happy to be working alongside some, some really great people. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Teammates, Amy Lawrence, David Ornstein, that's not bad. It's not bad, is it? It's... Uh, it's not bad. I saw someone compare it to Arsenal's front three of Aubameyang, Lacazette and Pepe. I was very flattered by that. Um, I wouldn't dare to hazard a guess at which one I might be. But yeah. no, I, I really am looking forward to working with those guys and, and learning a lot from them. And I think it's uh, a really interesting prospect and a, a really interesting model. And I, I hope it works because, you know, I think it will introduce some really quality writing without, you know, clickbait and advertising and all those things. Mm. Um, so it'd be great if it could sort of replicate to an extent what, what's already happened with Ask Blog, a focus on the, the content first. So that would be really nice. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, just for the record, I should uh, point out that I turned The Athletic down. Um, n- not... Uh, out of any other reason than we'd already built something here with our Patreon and our subscribers and the idea that we could then take that away and and move it somewhere else just didn't fit um, with what we're doing here. And obviously, we're very grateful to all the people who who support what we do on Patreon and and we're happy to to have you along. Uh, But, you know, it's interesting to have these different models these days, isn't it, where, you know, you're, you're, you're paying for for good stuff and for quality stuff and people are willing to do that they're willing to pay when the content is good so i mm. think it's going to be very interesting to see um how, how it goes because you know not just you guys but some very very good writers as well uh, who are covering stuff that isn't just arsenal um michael yeah. cox for example taking his tactical stuff over there will be will be very interesting to to work on a platform where i guess more than um, anywhere else apart from his own website, I guess. You've sort of got a blank slate to do to do the stuff mm. you really want to do. Yeah, definitely. And you're not constrained by, you know, uh, needing to get a certain number of hits or, you know, having to meet a certain word count. Uh, and that was a big part of the chats I had with The Athletic was having that freedom to sort of just write stuff that I, I want to write rather than stuff that I'm sort of asked to write. Yeah, and, or stuff um, that you kind of have to write within the within the framework of, I don't want to say mainstream media or whatever, cycle. but yeah, the news yeah. cycle and everything else. It's sort of, you know, one game to the next game to the next game to the press conference, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's quite, I guess, refreshing um, from that point of view. Mm. Yeah, and if you are thinking of signing up, my advice to any listeners, I would do it in August. There's a a 50% off deal, I think, that lasts for for the whole month. And after that, it goes up a bit. I think at 50%, it's like £2.50 a month. And, you know, I understand, you know, more and more models are sort of requiring some sort of payment. But really, when you think about what that is in your life, you know, it's like we say always about Arsblog. I mean, it's, you know, it's a coffee, it's a pint, it's a couple of coffees. It's, It's really not a hugely consequential amount of money. And I think, you know, as as we've shown on the Patreon here, I think it does sort of prove worthwhile in terms of what it can do and what it can produce. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, best of luck with it, obviously. Uh, and you know, part of the uh, part of the the intense negotiations you went through with the Athletic were to ensure that we we keep doing the Arscast Extra, and as always, yeah. it'll be free uh, to everybody until the end of time, or until you know we we no longer do it or can do it, or the world becomes just too uh, dry and inhospitable to human life. Life. So that will yes. continue. Uh, I, I, I was very, very keen to keep doing that. In fact, it was a sort of, you know, something I wouldn't really negotiate on. So, yeah, I'm really glad to be here, especially because I believe I'm right in saying it's our 300th episode. Isn't yes, it? it is. Happy birthday. It's our 300th uh, Arscast Extra. So if you've been here since day one and you've been with us through uh, through the, the beginning, through Falcons, through Magpies, through Jam uh, and Butter, <laughs> and of course, a little bit of Arsenal along the way, thank you very much indeed uh, to all mm. of you for listening. It makes it... Um, 
it makes it all worthwhile, which sounds really cheesy, but, you know, it was amazing when I was out in the States to meet so many people who are like, oh, we just love the podcast. It's a connection to the club for us over here. But they just kind of, they just really wanted to say thank you for, for just doing the podcast and for, for being entertaining. And we love doing it. That's the other thing about it is that, you know, there's some things that you do in your life, even if you're privileged enough to do what we do and to write about Arsenal, there are certain things you can do that, that do maybe feel like a bit of of a chore at times, but not this. And it's been a pleasure, uh, you know, uh, doing 300 episodes with you. Um, so there you go. I'm feeling quite nice and sentimental this morning. Yeah, no, it is, it is a, a lovely landmark to reach. I mean, it's a lot of time in our lives, isn't it? It's it probably, is. It's, da- it's days of our lives that we've done this for, but... yeah. Uh, no regrets, yeah. I've uh, I've enjoyed it all, and oh. lots more to come. Yeah. Hopefully, see you see you all at six hundred. Yes, exactly. Well, look, there's a brand new season almost upon us, James. Preseason is now. Well, I guess preseason is not over, but the preseason fixtures are over. Mm. The transfer deadline is on Thursday. Um, we've got our first game of the season next Sunday, and it feels like it's come around really, really quickly, doesn't it? You know, the summer has flown by and here we go again. We're going headfirst into a brand new season. How are you feeling about where we are and how we're prepared? Do you want to, I mean, we can talk about that or do you want to talk, did you see the Barcelona game? I saw extended highlights. Did you see the full game? I did. I sat down, I watched the full game uh, last night on a stream with uh, Portuguese commentary. So I learned mm. some words of Portuguese that I've since forgotten, but there you go. Uh, what did you make of it? What did I make of it? I thought it was sort of a microcosm of our preseason in that there were some really encouraging things. There were things I liked. And then I think without anything being too terrible, the stuff that we already know about what needs to happen was sort of highlighted and hammered home to us. So I, I think that's been true of most of this preseason. There have been some really encouraging things that have happened on the pitch, particularly with young players. There have been some some really nice moments as well. There have been uh, times where we've played nice, attractive football. We scored a great goal, mm. but of course, defensively, we we have our we have our problems and we have our issues that that need to be to be sorted out. So, you know, in the first half. I thought there were, I thought Joe Willock again, I know people are going to, you know, start saying uh, Joe Willock is uh, somebody I keep talking about, but, you know, during this off season and, and, and looking at him, you know, up close and personal in the US and on TV when we've played our other games, to me has been the most impressive young player uh, of the preseason. He's been the most encouraging part of it. Uh, I thought Maitland-Niles was good in the first half, but we have um, worries about him. Second half, not so great. Reese Nelson, not bad in the first half. We might talk a little bit about him uh, as well a bit later on. Uh, The goal, Ozil to Aubameyang, fantastic. What a Uh, goal. What a goal and what a finish. I mean, great pass Mm. um, Mm. from Ozil. I mean, that that is kind of where he can make an impact, isn't it? When we're playing with a back four and he's got a little bit of room to move around the pitch and he can see the pass uh, to Aubameyang and he's got in Aubameyang a player who can make something of that pass. So... Yeah. I I thought it was... Everything about that goal was great. The pass into Aubameyang, the way he took it and turned and the finish was sensational. I mean... Speaking of preseason positives, I think he has been one of the big ones. Yep. He's looked incredibly sharp, basically since he came back. Um, he obviously keeps himself in good shape and he looks like he's ready to hit the ground running, which could be really important for us. Yeah, and if we are at this moment in time uh, encouraged and enthused by anything, it is, it is you know, the attacking side of our game. Because we've got Aubameyang, yeah. we've got Lacazette, we've got Mesut Ozil probably back in a position which suits him much more than um, than playing with a you know a three at the back, which which just doesn't really suit him. I think there's still some question marks over him, but you know if we can get him anywhere close to his best, it could be 
it could be an important part of how we play next season. We've signed Nicola Pepe, which of course is hugely exciting. Let's talk about that for a moment. I mean, what what's your thoughts on on that signing and what it means and uh, and how excited were you by by that deal going through? Well, it, I think it's a hell of a statement for Arsenal to go out and spend that money on a, any player, no matter how the deal is structured. Uh, I think it's a real coup for the club to land one of you know, the prime European talents who impressed last season, I think would have been on everybody's radar. I didn't really believe until it was actually happening that we could land Pepe. I just thought mm. you know, he'd want to play Champions League football or a, a bigger club would become involved or a richer club maybe. So I think it's a fantastic, fantastic signing. Um, I think if I had one word of caution, it would be, I, I think the price tag is so high that maybe there's an expectation that he is going to be f- a phenomenon. And I think... I'm a little bit cautious about that. I think he'll be yeah. good, but I, but you know, I, and I think that's what a good player costs. But I think because of the way we spend money, I think some people are expecting Lionel Messi, and I don't think that's what we've got. You know, no, that's true, and I think we have to remember he is still just 24. Uh, you know, off the back of one brilliant season for Lille. Uh, mm. You know, it can take players' time to uh, adjust and adapt to the Premier League. And I do think as well, he is coming into a team which has some fairly uh, fundamental flaws in it, which can have yeah. an impact on on the way attacking players play. Because, you know, I, I know we've beaten this drum countless times, but in order to, to be really effective from an attacking point of view, you have to have some kind of platform, a defensive platform on which to base your game. And right mm. now, I feel like we don't. And that's a problem. So, you know, th- yeah, we can temper that. But, yeah, look. I, but nevertheless, I, yeah. it, it's great news. There's no doubt about that. Of course. And it is a, a signing that kind of uh, sends a statement. And the fact that he chose us over other options, you know, gives you some faith that there's a direction for the club and a plan and a project that he is aware of and can get behind. You know, Mm. I don't think, you know, there's money, of course, as the lure of the Premier League and everything else. But, you know, he wanted to come and play with Aubameyang and play with Lacazette and play with Ozil. You know, he mentioned those guys specifically. So um, from our point of view, the fact that we're still attractive enough to get that player in um, is is fantastic. Um, So where 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 are we going from here? Should we talk about the, the flaws? I mean. The other part of the Barcelona game, of course, was the Maitland-Niles own goal. Yeah. What, what, what's what's your, your take on him at right back? Because I have some, I have some worries. You know, I think he's, I think he's a good player. I think he, in the first half against Barcelona, showed some real composure in our box. Um, he was quick. He used the ball well. He defended well, but. As we've seen, for example, in the Europa League final, I'm not sure he quite gets it from a fully defensive point of view. And we are, of course, waiting for Hector Bellerin to come back in. And mm. you can understand why we're not going to go out and spend £20 million on a right back when we've got a player in Hector Bellerin who hopefully will be first choice for, for years to come. But do you think we're taking just a little bit of a risk by continuing with Maitland Niles at right back, or, or should he be good enough? We are, we are taking a slight risk, but I think it's a risk I'm okay with taking. I mean, when I watch Maitland Niles, I do see someone with a lot of gifts. You know, he's got good technique, he's incredibly athletic. Um, and I think that on paper, he has a lot of the attributes to play as a fullback. I understand that it's not a position he's particularly experienced in, but when I watch him at fullback, I, I very rarely think oh, it would be better if this guy was in central midfield. Uh, You know, in some ways, Mm -hmm. those lapses of concentration at fullback, as costly as they can be, I think they can also be costly in the middle of the park. And I think you almost get more opportunities to make them at times. But didn't he say last year that he wanted to be a winger? That was his his uh, quote from last season. He wants to be a winger. So if you make that Mm. mistake 
in the opposition third, maybe it doesn't hurt you quite as much. True. You know, uh, and, and Wenger was the one who talked him up as a defensive midfielder. I don't see a defensive midfielder in there really either. So no. I, I just worry or wonder about where exactly um, he is going to end up or if we're going to end up in a, a situation not dissimilar to that of Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain where he hasn't been able to properly nail down a position which really suits him. That might be the case, but I mean, the Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain story, as, as much as we might reflect on it with elements of regret, does end with us doubling our money on a on a player. Mm. And, you know, in the case of Ainsley Maitland-Niles, I think he is a useful squad member for us to have. I think he can provide cover at right back. And if it doesn't work out for him, and somewhere down the line we sell a player who, by that point, has collected a lot of Premier League experience, a lot of Europa League experience, is English, so we'll have a a decent transfer value attached to him. I can kind of live with that. I, you know, I just think with the constraints we're under and having spent the money we've spent already this summer, you know, we're looking at centre-back, we're looking at left-back. I'm not sure I can see us, you know, doing a right-back as well. No, I don't think we will either. I don't think we will. But I, I, I also think it's a little bit of a gamble, a little bit of a risk, considering mm. some of the some of the issues that Maitland-Niles has defensively. And I think, for the most part, he, he plays quite well there. But I just I just worry about his natural defensive instincts. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a trade-off, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a bit like Kolasinac, to be honest, on the other side, where going forward, he gives you quite a lot, and defensively, there are issues there. I just wonder, sort of, who can you get for, as your backup right-back where there isn't some degree mm. of compromise, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, other things that sort of struck me throughout the the mm. preseason, um, players who who haven't really progressed in the way that we would like, and I'm thinking of uh, Mkhitaryan here, I'm thinking of Mustafi, obviously, I'm thinking of Granit Xhaka, that there still appears to be a heavy reliance on these guys Maybe there are ways around it, but are you are you a little bit concerned that we're still we're still looking at these guys as as regular first team starters? Well, I mean, I don't know if that's entirely true. I mean, it looks to me like, for example, in the case of Mustafi, it feels like Chambers and Socrates yeah. are going to be the central defensive partnership there. And you know, Mkhitaryan. Once Pepe comes into the side, I think is going to be vulnerable. With Alex Awobi coming back from Afcon as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the real shame is that we've not been able to move these players on yet. You know, we've not been able to sell them, and it seems like Arsenal are calling in the big guns to try and do those deals. I mean, obviously there was the talk about uh, Jorge Mendes uh, trying to flog Mustafi to Monaco or pretty much anywhere else that will take him. Yeah. Uh, I'll be really interested to see what happens after the British transfer deadline, the English transfer deadline, rather, uh, to see if there's more movement in terms of getting people out of the club and what we might be able to do. Because, you know, I'm not going to describe those players as dead wood, but they clearly could be surplus to requirements and are quite expensive to have on the books. Yeah, that's a fair point. That is a fair point. But obviously we, as a football club, have got to put in place... Um, our own structures, which would allow those players to be sold if there were suitors out there for them. So, you know, if you talk about Mkhitaryan, for example, yeah. um, you're right, we've got Pepe, we've got uh, Aubameyang who can play in the wide positions, we've got a young player in Reese Nelson coming through, Alex Iwobi is somebody who can do a job mm -hmm. in there as well, there's Mesut Ozil uh, who may well be ahead of him, so you could see how there might be room for for Mkhitaryan to depart if somebody came in for him. The the issue I think we have with someone like Mustafi, it seems obvious that Arsenal would like to move him on, but mm -hmm. at this moment in time, we have only got three senior central defenders available to us. Socrates, mm. Callum Chambers, and Mustafi is the other one because Rob Holding is still maybe six weeks away from a first team return and even then you've got to ease him back into into action you can't just put holding in and expect him to play two or three games a week you can't do that it, it's too dangerous Koscielny the Koscielny situation 
that's stagnating, whatever you want to call that. That's a, that's an awful situation for us to be dealing with at this moment in time because yeah. um, I think if you just lay everything else to one side, we need Lauren Koscielny. Right now, based on the squad we have, we need Koscielny. But we don't have him and we're probably not going to have him for next season because his position has been made untenable. So there is, this week, a lot to sort out. Whether that's actually finding some measure of peace or compromise with Koscielny, which I wouldn't rule out completely, just because of the difficulty we appear to be having in finding a central defender, and also bringing somebody in anyway, because we do need to bring somebody else in, even if Koscielny comes back or even if Koscielny goes, we need to bring in somebody who might facilitate the the departure of Mustafi, if we can find someone to buy him. Well, the tricky thing with Koscielny is, you know, that really is one that could run until the end of the month. But mm. Arsenal need to make a decision on if they can get someone in before that. Uh, I, I mean, we are going to be working right to the wire, you imagine, because there's the Kieran Tierney potential deal at left back mm. uh, and, and the centre-half situation. How do you feel about the Kieran Tierney one? I just wonder, with all these stories of these injury problems that he's still suffering with, I wonder if Arsenal's interest might have cooled a bit there. I, yeah, I guess it depends on how serious this injury he has is. I mean, if you see him as your left back for the next five years, an eight-week injury shouldn't change... Mm your desire to do the deal. Um, it might change your ability to move on one of the left-backs, though. So if you sign Tierney, you're not going to be able to move Kolasinac or Monreal until January, at which point, you know, the the, the transfer window isn't at its... Um, Most fluid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or you might not get as much as you might like for him. Um I don't know. I mean, look, if he, he's been out since April, they're talking about another eight weeks... And then realistically, you're looking at another, what, two months on top of that before a player gets really fully match fit and match sharp and everything else. So you're looking at Tierney basically not being available uh, at his best until somewhere around Christmas. So mm. m- maybe you wait until January to do that yeah. deal. You put that to one side and you wait and you keep the money that you were going to use and you do it in January if he's fit. And available, but you do it on the first of January. Yeah. You know what I mean. I, I, I do wonder if that might well happen with Tierney, because mm. um, also as well by then, you know, we might have sold some players at the end of August. We might know a little bit more what our budget looks like. And, and Celtic, the noise is coming out of Celtic. I mean, for a player, Neil Lennon says he doesn't want to sell. He's talking about selling him an awful lot, uh, and it almost feels like as Arsenal's uh, the intensity of Arsenal's interest wanes, it feels like we hear more from Celtic uh, and I do just wonder if there's a sense of like oh is this our opportunity to really cash in and make the big money on Tierney uh, in this last week of the window so I think we we might well wait and that might not be the worst thing because we get to see if he gets over this injury if there are any resulting problems from what I understand it can be quite a, a complicated one that he's got with his hip and it can mm. have quite a difficult recovery path so you know we've got a long standing interest in the player I don't see the harm in taking a slightly longer term view and and making do with Kalasnach and, and Monreal for the first half of the season. Yeah, it is. It it, it does feel like making do though, because when you do pursue yeah. a player as publicly as we have, it it speaks to your faith in the options that you currently have. So um, yeah, well, well, there is an alternative. I mean, let's not forget we spent a long time talking about the prospect of Wilfred Zaha and ended up with Nicolas Pepe so it's very clear in that scenario there was more than one option Mm. maybe there is another option in the left back area that we don't know about that hasn't been reported in the press yeah Uh, and maybe the club will decide to to make a move on that one it just depends I suppose how attached they are to the idea of of Tierney specifically yeah that's true that's true I mean it should be possible to find a left back with similar qualities out there somewhere You'd across think. Europe. Maybe not even for for quite as much money. So yeah, let's see what let's see what they um let's see what they do. How worried are you on a scale of one to ten about the centre of our defence going into this new season? I'm pretty worried. <laughs> I'm pretty worried. I mean look, I, I can't lie. There's part of me that 
is can make peace with a certain degree of it at the moment because I'm so enthused about our prospects going forward. You know, you add Pepe to that cocktail with Aubameyang, Lacazette, Ozil, uh, young players like Nelson and Ketia, Willock. I genuinely do find that really exciting as yeah. a prospect and I, I'm looking forward to watching that. And, you know, it almost feels like reconnecting with an Arsenal that, you know, I, I've always loved, the one that's built on attacking threat and maybe not so much on defensive security. I reserve the right to completely flip my opinions on that as soon as we concede <laughs> a calamitous goal. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think, like, in theory, it's all well and good, but as soon as we start shipping goals and dropping points, people will be absolutely up in arms about why we haven't addressed the centre of our defence. They have to do something, right? Because you can't go into a new season off the back of a season in which you conceded 51 goals in the Premier League and um, and all the rest with a defence that's worse than the one you had last season. Because the one we've got right now is worse. Our options mm. are worse. We've got, um, you know, the, the, there is an issue with Mustafi in that public opinion regarding his suitability for this football club is at kind of an all-time low. And that's yeah. something that they have to be aware of as well, that there isn't the appetite anymore to to deal with the mistakes, um, you know, and to not do something about the defence, particularly the centre of defence, would be negligent in the extreme. So I find it hard to imagine that between now and Thursday, we don't do something, but you'd be hard pressed to make a case that it appears to have been a priority during this summer. No, I mean, the priority was clearly the wide player. I think that's been evident since the start of the window. And that is surprising in some respects. I, you know, we did need a wide player. There's oh, no yeah, doubt yeah, yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think what Rouse and Yehi would turn around and say, or, or Unai Emery, I think, kind of has said in press conferences, well, we've signed a fantastic centre-back this summer. But as we all know, it's somebody who cannot play for 12 months. So mm. it doesn't really help our chances this season. Yeah, it is concerning. And I know a lot of hopes are being pinned on Rob Holding. But if you ask me what was most impressive about Rob Holding in both his spells in the first team, really... I would probably think more of his ability on the ball, you know, bringing the ball out from the back, his passing ability. Mm. Those are the aspects of his game that are most striking to me, not necessarily, you know, his ability to organise the line or man mark or, you know, marshal the defence. And so even in that, even in his comeback, there is still that room for doubt, that, that element of concern. Mm. Well, Unai Emery was asked about signing defenders and he said... Only if we can sign a player who really, really can improve our squad, then we're going to do it. If not, then not. So, where's the where's the bar for improvement? If he really improves us or really, really improves us? I mean, the obvious gag there is, given how bad our defence is, you shouldn't be short of options uh, when it comes to players who could come in and make us better. But it doesn't sound to me, yeah. I'm a, just slightly concerned about what he's saying there. Like if I was, on the one hand, right, I think if I were Unai Emery and the club wasn't signing defenders, I would be really worried about that because... He doesn't strike me as a stupid man and he must look at his defence and know that it needs to be improved. So if you were trying to put some pressure on the club to make things happen, then wouldn't you be a bit more public about it rather than just saying only if we can sign a player, a player who really improves us, which sounds a bit like a line uh, that we heard many times from Arsene Wenger and one which is perhaps a little bit coached, if you like, into Unai Emery. If you're asked about transfers, just say this. Uh, you know, we keep our cards close to our chest. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe. I mean, you know, I, I, the club have sort of positively surprised me on several fronts this summer in terms of what they've been able to do. And so I don't want to write them off with a week to go in the window and, you know, declare their, their failure to land a centre-half as a massive disappointment because 
you know, maybe they could turn up with one. Uh, I really, really hope they do. One wonders if, you know, what did you think about the, the news about Manchester United paying £85 million for Harry Maguire? I mean, does that tell you something about how difficult it is to find a quality centre-half at the moment? Yes, yeah, it does. It also probably tells you something a bit about Manchester United and their willingness to overpay for players, something we've seen mm. uh, in the past before. Uh, you know, there is a... There is a, a Premier League tax and he's an English international and he's probably, as much because of his size as anything else, the standout English centre half. Mm -hmm. um, but they needed a, a defender and they've gone out and they've got it. I mean, it's crazy, £85 million for a player like Harry. He's the most expensive defender in the world, which is absurd. You know, he's, yeah. he's all right, but like... But, you know, I... I I think there have to be players out there who can make us better. There have to be. And if we're willing to do what we did with, with Saliba, for example, and, you know, identify a young talent and bring him in, and if we're willing to, you know, to push the boat out for a Nicola Pepe, who is a player we needed, or that kind of player, there's no question, and it's it's exciting to, to bring in that kind of a player, it feels to me like we should also have the same priority when it comes to our defense because that is and has been a problem for a number of years so as much as we needed a wide player we also need a center half so can we push the boat out can we go the extra mile and sign a player of similar stature to to Nicola Pepe no a young guy maybe not 18 19 like Saliba but Somebody who's got some years of experience and who can who can turn his potential into something a bit more. Quite who that is, I don't know. But then again, this is not our job, and the club have got scouts out there and mm -hmm. should be looking out there. You know, if if we've if we've kind of gone all in on Pepe at the expense of a good central defender, as much as I love what we did with Pepe, you've got to ask a question as to whether that was the right thing to do. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying we shouldn't have signed Pepe, but the, the defence is a real worry. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Pepe sort of became the, as compared to Saha, was perceived as like the sensible signing because he as a player represented a better investment. But I suppose what's not sensible about either deal is if they prohibit you from buying a centre-half who mm. can help you this season. I mean, when you're talking about a young player with promise who has got experience already but could develop into a real star, you know, I'm no Bundesliga expert, but the two boys at Leipzig, yeah. Meccano and Canate, they immediately spring to mind. And there is that sort of new francophonic core at the heart of this Arsenal squad. You know, you've got Aubameyang, Lacazette, Pepe, Genduzzi, Saliba to join. So to get another French international in, mm. uh, in, in the heart of the defence, feels plausible and feels like that would be a really good move. I don't think either would come cheap, but, you know, this isn't... We talk about Tierney for the next 10, five years. I mean, we could be signing a centre-half for the next 10 years if we get this right. Mm. Uh, there's probably no other area of the pitch where apart from goalkeeper maybe where you buy a player who has that kind of longevity so if any area is is worthy of investment it's surely surely that and sooner or later it's going to have to happen you know if it doesn't happen now it's going to have to happen in january it's going to have to happen in the summer you know so that if that cost can sort of be spread out over those years then we've got to do it we've got to do it because if we do, then I think every Arsenal fan, if we can sign a good centre-half in this window, as much as we'd like a left-back, as much as we'd like a right-back, as much as we might want something else in other areas of the park, I think every Arsenal fan would reflect on that as a really positive window, if we can get mm. a centre-half who can help us this season. Yeah, yeah, I think we can... I'd like a left-back, but I think we can live without a left-back. I don't think we can go into the new season with a central defensive lineup of... Chambers, Socrates, and Mustafi with holding, you know, on his way back. Mavropanos has not played a minute of preseason football. He's still got that that injury. So, you know, I think we we can't count on him as a first team player for for the foreseeable future. Um, and even then, there are questions over his his readiness 
you know, we've spoken before, haven't we, about how he he might well need a loan. So I think a central defender would basically complete what has otherwise been a very promising window because Pepe, we've talked about, Ceballos, I think, is a smart signing. And I know we only got to see a little bit of him last night against... Uh, against Barcelona and he took a kick apparently he's going to be out for a few days uh, because of a, a really nasty challenge on him um, oh really yeah it was just it was yeah it was nasty it was studs into the ankle kind of stuff um, uh, and a, apparently he's he's going to miss a few days training because of that so whether he's ready for Sunday remains to be seen but you know overall I think a smart signing with, with something to prove and he can bring something to the team and bring something to midfield, an area which, you know, feels competitive. It feels competitive with, with Torreira, with Genduzi, with Ceballos, with Joe Willock pushing Xhaka. Um, you know, uh, we've got some some backup, I suppose, in El Nenny if, if he doesn't end up going somewhere. Um, Iwobi's in there too, you know. So that feels like a, a nice competitive mix. Uh, what I've seen of Martinelli looks very promising as well. He's only 18, of course, and you don't want to heap too much pressure on him. But, you know, you can see how the things that we've done in the transfer market this summer have been quite smart and really do add something to the team. So if we can get mm-hmm. a center half, we we more or less complete that. But it's sort I don't know what sort of analogy to draw here, but it, it feels incomplete at this moment in time and the clock is ticking. So they've they've got to get it done this week. They have to. Yeah, they have to. I mean, it's been a long summer and I think there's a lot of business still left to do. And I actually expect the last few days to be pretty frenetic. Um, so fingers crossed Arsenal can can get this over the line and complete a, a good summer's work. I mean, you mentioned very briefly that you think there could yet be a bit of a, a reprieve, a reconciliation with Laurent Koscielny. Do you think that's realistic, particularly? Not, not really. Right. Not really, but I feel like if... If we can't find the player in the market, we might try and mend fences simply because it, it gives us a a player in there. I, you know, the circumstances are terrible because he wants to leave. Um, you wonder about his motivation. You wonder about um, the reception that he's going to get because I can see from social media there people are very divided on it. There are a lot of people who think, well, you know, Kishandi's given us lots of service and we should be um, mindful of that and let him go or we should, you know, bend to to his desire to leave. Uh, other people are absolutely furious with him. They uh, feel that as captain, he has a responsibility to behave in a certain way. You know, you'll find all very uh, various opinion across the spectrum on him. But I think more... More than most, it is is going to be a decisive thing if Koscielny plays again. You don't want, for example, Koscielny to come onto the pitch and like for half the fans in the stadium to boo him, which is not beyond the realms of possibility given the way he's behaved and his behavior has not been acceptable at all. So it's just about whether or not we can find the right solution for the team. That's all. I mean, it's it would be the last throw of the dice, but... Who knows? Stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. That is true. And I suppose, you know, depending on what happens before the deadline, that will change the dynamic of those talks with with Laurent Koscielny. But I find it very, very hard to see him coming back. And I I don't think he'll be here after August 31st, you know, at the moment. Me neither. But you never know. We'll we'll wait and see. Um... Okay, what else? Is there anything else you want to see the club do before the transfer window closes, before the the start of the new season? Um, I'm just trying to think, really. Uh, I mean, as I say, I think there are some players who I would probably try and move on. I don't think Xhaka would be one for me. Uh, I think that his experience, uh, his knowledge of the English game, his general fitness and availability will probably be useful this season. Mm. And I'd like to think maybe by next season we might be in a place where we could move him on and move on from him and he'd still be under contract and acquire a decent fee. But I don't think we're quite in that place yet. I mean, I suppose the club has to address the the captaincy situation yeah. uh, formally before the first match. 
I mean, it feels like Granit Xhaka is going to wear the armband, doesn't it, in a, mm. in a lot of our games? Yeah, it does. How do you feel about that? Um, I can see why it would happen. I can see why he's the choice. Mm. But, yeah, I just, I just worry that by making him captain, you, you sort of become not reliant on him. Do you know what I mean? It, it's just sort of... Um, you sort of uh, you're wedded to him a bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit too wedded to him. And I you know, look, I I, I think Granite Xhaka does some stuff very well. I also think that there are flaws in his game which have been apparent for three years now he's been with us. Is that fair? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those are still there. And I you know, I would like us as a team to move away from the kind of player he is. You know, I think he's he's a very good distributor of the ball, but he gives it away a bit too often. He's careless at times. He's clumsy at times. We we can all think about that moment in the in the game against uh, Brighton towards the end of the season where we all knew he was going to give away a penalty in that position. We all knew yeah. it. We could see it coming and you know, without without improvement or without seeing a player who, who wants to improve or make those things in his game better, you know, I, I just, yeah, it bothers me a little, you know? It just bothers me a little. I, you know, I don't have any appetite to watch Granit Xhaka smash someone in our penalty box and give away uh, a, a spot kick, regardless of how good other parts of his game are. And like he, he does appear to have some natural leadership qualities. He fronts up to the media, you know. He's experienced. He's an international. He is in the in the squad itself. If you were to pick somebody as a kind of a captain character, you know, mm-hmm. he 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 is that. I can see that. But if that's kind of a factor in why you're getting picked, then that's not a good thing either. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I said this on the show before, but I'm granted some optimism by the fact that Unai Emery wasn't particularly wedded to any of his captains last year. You know, he dropped Petr Cech, he dropped Mesut Ozil. He was prepared to be quite ruthless about that when he needed to be. Uh, and I also think Shaka, he's quite a complex figure because I think, for me, I'm not sure he's quite uh, a sort of Mustafi level of troubling character on the field you know Mustafi I feel like a lot of his mistakes almost feel like it's very hard to phrase this but they feel like he's kind of throwing in the towel a little bit yeah I think Shaka is sort of more committed yes he's committed but clumsy ultimately and I kind of am slightly more forgiving of that I think it's problematic and I agree with you, it's not something we should be tied to in the long term. But I actually think as a character, he has a lot of uh, good qualities that I can see. You know, why he's captained teams in the past. I think mm. he was captain for a spell at uh, Borussia and I think he's captain Switzerland a couple of times. So I can see why he's on that list. Um I mean, I suppose it's, he's not going to be the formal captain, is he? It's going to be a list of five, we think, uh, with yeah. possibly Rob Holding among them. Really? Okay. Um, well, yeah, because he did say about having an English, an English player. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But, I mean, we did have Lauren Koscielny as the official club captain, you know, and he had five captains, of course, um, which, which I guess was mm. to create a kind of a leadership group and, and what have you. Um, maybe the fact that there are going to be five captains means that he doesn't see himself picking Shaka all the time so he's got yeah. to have some options maybe I think so I think so and yeah I mean it, at the start of the season I think Shaka will play because you know Ganduzi's not necessarily 100% ready uh, Terrera is not necessarily 100% ready we've just spoken about Sabios getting that kick so I think we are going to see Shaka in the team uh, at the kickoff. But I think as the season develops and the season evolves, it wouldn't surprise me if we move away from him a little bit. And I think a lot of fans want that, don't they? I think fans are more enthused about the prospect of, I don't know, Torreira, Ganduzi, Ceballos, Willock, 
players who are a bit more agile, shall we say, and maybe a bit more dynamic than Shaka. Yeah, yeah I think that's it. It's about style of play. It's about the style mm. of play. And, like, there are moments when Xhaka, uh is is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you look at the goal we scored against... Um, Barcelona last night. It was his pass out to Ozil that allowed Ozil the space to create for for Aubameyang. But then it's not it's not particularly um, difficult stuff to spread the ball wide if you're a reasonable passer of the ball, putting the ball into space uh, for an uh, for a teammate. It's bread and butter stuff, really, you know. Uh, mm. And and there are times when Jack's ponderousness. Um, and it, I, I even noticed this a little bit with Ozil as well, is that Ozil wants time on the ball. And more and more these days, the quicker you move the ball, the more space you're going to find because of the way teams are organized and organized defensively and simply because players are so quick and fast these days that you have to, you have to move the ball quickly so they're running backwards, not stick your foot on it and look around and see who's there, allowing them time to get back into position. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, this Arsenal team has needed to speed up. I think signing Pepe is part of that. But the the main way in which we can do it and we should do it, I think, is in the centre of the park. And it's going to be fascinating. I mean, Joe Willock, I agree with you, has been the standout young player from the from the preseason period. I think Eddie Nketi has also done pretty well, got himself a couple of goals in America. Mm. But I, I wonder just how much are we going to see of Willock in the Premier League? You know, will it be like Ganduzi last year, that he's dropped straight into the first team and, and in there from the very start. What mm. do you reckon? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he started on Sunday. wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm. But, you know, when we do get players back, Ganduzi was away on international duty. Terrell is only just back as well. So, they're, you know, Pepe as well. These are players who've got some pre-season training to do, you know, to get the, the fitness uh, into their legs before they start playing on a on a regular basis but you know you would hope that whatever the team being picked it's being picked on merit and not because somebody has the armband you know so of course yeah all right look i think we should take a break here because we've been going a little while we're going to come back and answer your questions and more in part two right after this Welcome back to the 300th Arscast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at Gunnar Blog and at Arse Blog on the Arse Blog Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Arse Blog, and also on the Arse Blog Discord server, which you can get access to if you are an Arse Blog member on Patreon. If you're not, sign up right now uh, at patreon.com forward slash Arse Blog from Discord. The first question comes from Black Ice. And he wants to know, James, the commentators love the passion, but do the players really pay any attention to Unai Emery's often unsafe gesticulations on the touchline? Hmm. Uh, I think, do they pay any attention? Surely not, really. I mean, unless you're like the fullback who's playing on that side right in front of the coach, surely those messages aren't really being conveyed. I mean... You know, in, in the tumult of a stadium with the noise being what it is, mm. it, it seems unlikely that you'd be able to give detailed tactical instructions from the side of a pitch with 60,000 fans around you, don't you think? Yeah. Isn't that the point that Louis van Hal always made? He's going, they can't hear me. And the preparation is, you know, is done on the training ground and in the in the build up to a game, your tactical preparation. I mean, obviously, there are things that a manager can do and he wants to do um, to try and uh, adjust things during a game. So you can give a message, you know, if the, if it's the left back or whatever, you know, to give a message and and and, uh, and what have you. But, you know, realistically, I don't know that it has a huge effect but Emery is one of those guys who wants to basically micromanage a game, isn't he? The way he operates on the touchline, he really just wants to get into the nuts and bolts of it. And he's always talk, shouting at people and looking uh, to get them back and, and what have you. So um, I wonder, is it as much about him feeling like he's in control of things uh, as anything else? Yeah, of course. We all do it as fans, don't we? We stand yeah. there watching the game, saying, you know, man on, or something. Drop! I can't what hear are you us. doing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're giving instructions. I think it's just, 
it's passion, it's uh, adrenaline, it's all those things. And I think you're right. It's about Emery sort of letting out that and f- having like a, a sense of control mm. rather than necessarily having it. I mean, we've seen managers, you know, sending notes onto the pitch and things like that in the past when they yeah. do want to get messages across. There are ways around it. And I guess if you've done, if you've done, you know, we saw this with set pieces last season that it seemed like sometimes they were signalling from the bench to indicate let's do a certain set piece. Yeah. Usually a short corner, usually it didn't work. Mm. But uh, there are things you can put in place like that. But I think for the most part, the pointing and shouting, much like Matthew Flamini's pointing and shouting, is pointless. Mm. Pointy, shouty blokes. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess. Look, sometimes it works. You know, you got you got someone like, uh, you know, a Tony Adams at the back who organises and who does scream and shout at his, uh, at his own players. You know, it can have an effect, but that's slightly different because you're on the pitch um, and you're able to talk directly to your teammates and, and give them a rocket up the arse if that's what they need. But from a manager's point of view, I think it's more about him feeling in control than it is beneficial for the players. Yeah, and I wonder if it has a slight of impact on the supporters, maybe. Yeah. I, I do think that if you're in the crowd and you see the manager really going for it and getting into it, I mean, look at the sort of uh, chemistry that's been created between Jurgen Klopp and the fans at Anfield. You know, he, he's almost the conductor there. He's orchestrating the whole thing. And I think as a supporter, I like seeing a bit of passion from the manager on the sideline. And I think it probably reflects and makes the fans go that little bit louder or what have you. And yeah. that could all have a kind of, you know slightly intangible impact on things. Mm. Um, Gunner Doc on the Discord asks, how would you like the idea of us taking Gary Cahill for a year <laughs> or two in the current situation? He ticks many of the boxes you would have liked Koscielny to do. And a few people asked about this. Gary Cahill, of course, is currently on a, a free transfer, having left Chelsea. Uh, I think he's being linked quite strongly with Crystal Palace. Uh Seventy week or one or two years. So, what do you think? Thirty three years old, Gary Kay. No, no. It's a no from you. Yeah, it's a no from me. I think. What did he play last season? You know, for for Chelsea. How often did he play? Um, let me just see if I can now. get his stats. Uh, he, he wasn't particularly regular. No. Um, I think. Let's he, have a look. Yeah. He played. Two substitute appearances in the Premier League. Is that right? I'm just looking. It won't load. Come on, load, you motherfucker. According to this, he played 21 minutes of a game, uh, a nil-nil with West Ham. And then on the final day, he played a minute yeah. against what? So you want us to sign a player with 22 minutes of Premier League football in the last season? What on earth makes people think that would be a good deal for us? Like, I'm, I'm not a fan of Mustafi, as I'm sure everyone is aware. I think he's a player we need to move on from, but I think I'd keep Mustafi over Cahill simply because he's, you know, he's a 27-year-old guy who can at least run. I don't think Cahill's got the legs anymore. I just don't see Gary Cahill as being capable um, to do what we would want him to do. It feels like a signing for a signing's sake, I have to say. Um, yeah, it's like... I'd almost yeah. rather give that game time to a young player, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Don't there. even know if we've got a young player who's ready to, to make the step up. Zach Medley uh, played some minutes on the tour, whether they're in any way convinced by his readiness just yet. He is only 18 as well, so... Um, but yeah, like you, I would rather give minutes to a young player than, than sign someone like Gary Cahill, so... Well, what about this? I mean, on the same topic, Linus Widner on Facebook asked, could we have any chance of landing Dunk, Duffy or Tarkovsky? Or are they not suited to the Arsenal high line? Do you think there are players in the Premier League that Arsenal could be looking at in the centre-half position? Possibly, but they'll be expensive, won't they? I think that's the big issue, isn't it? They'll be yeah. really expensive. Um, so, I mean, there, are, there have to be players who can come in and who can do something um, in this team. There have to be. But... Yeah, I mean, I was really struck. It, it, there might be some sour grapes involved, but I was reading some sort of uh, Leicester fan posts about the Harry Maguire deal to Manchester United, and a lot of Leicester fans were saying, well, it's all right with us because Johnny Evans is a better defender. 
And obviously, obviously Johnny Evans was a player who was linked with Arsenal for a long time. And, you know, it wasn't a particularly exciting or, or glamorous deal in prospect. But from the sounds of things, mm. he's been very good there. And I, I just wonder if maybe there are players of that calibre. I mean, the bar isn't especially high at mm. Arsenal in exactly. terms of coming in and improving things. Yeah. Um, I think I had a question about that, actually. I lost it here but it was about like did we make a did we make a bit of a mistake by not signing Johnny Evans for three million pounds and at the time you're mm-hmm. thinking well you know that can't really be a mistake uh, but you know hindsight's a wonderful thing and we are where we are in terms of the centre of our defence um, okay here's a question from Stuart Blumen on Facebook who says which specific preseason moment got you most excited <sighs> Um, does it have to be with, does he mean within a game? Um, I guess it can be anything. Anything. I think it would have to be when David Ornstein tweeted that Arsenal had <laughs> greeted fee with Leo Fern, Nicholas Pepe. <laughs> it was just one of those things where you found yourself, I think we said this, but, you know, double checking it wasn't a fake account mm. because it was such an extraordinary piece of news. Um, and yeah, I, I suddenly thought, wow, maybe things are changing. Maybe we're going somewhere. Mm. And everything that followed that signing, you know, I, I loved the video of him being shown around the training ground like you. I loved him seeing his Arsenal shirt yeah. printed with 19 on the back. I loved seeing Lacazette acting as a, a bit of a translator for him, helping him settle. I loved seeing Edu and Raul Sanye, you know, greeting him and seeing, OK, there is a bit of an executive team there. You know, Edu is already prominent in that role um so yeah i think everything around the pepe deal for me within a game itself i, I would just go back to Aubameyang again i mean i i think i think i'd look at his goal against barcelona i know he was brilliant uh, against bayern and yeah. it's been good all through the preseason but the way he took that goal it was so confident and so emphatic I'm really, really excited about what we might see from him this season. Yeah, there's a few moments that stand out for me. One is Aubameyang tearing down the right-hand side um, against Bayern Munich. Maybe it was down, mm-hmm. right down the middle, in fact. An amazing run, and he just looks so sharp and so determined um, in that game. And it was maybe our first game of preseason, certainly the first game of the U.S. Tour. Um, Eddie Nketiah knocking the giant Bayern Munich central defender uh, away as he was shielding the ball. You know, the guy is probably a good six inches taller than Enkedia and um, wider and more physically imposing, but but Eddie just knocked him out of the way, and that was good. And obviously, we've spoken about Joe Willock, the development of, of him over the course of preseason. Um, the Real Madrid game as well in Washington, D.C., where we were sort of under the cosh, and then he brought on Reese Nelson, Saka, Tyrese John Jules, and maybe Enketia. And those four guys changed the dynamic of the game. Those things are really exciting because we we can sort of pin hopes on young players. And, you know, I think we all know not all of them are going to make it and some of them won't be as good as we want them to be or that we hope they might be. But in this sort of... In this... Uh, time before the season begins we can kind of project onto them qualities that we we see could be useful throughout the course mm. of the season so th- things like that got me excited um obviously the pepe signing as well is hugely exciting um yeah and that's where we are that's where we are and are you feeling excited yes generally i am genuinely i'm feeling excited because we do have this great array of attacking potential within the team and and I can see how it might transform or at least change significantly the way we play and the way we might approach certain games that you know we could be a bit more front-footed particularly when we go away from home where we've been Mm. conservative and I hope that you know the the approach this season is a bit more like well let's go and fucking play these guys rather than mm-hmm. let's go and see if we can hold these guys off and hit them on the break that there is a slight worry yeah, in my mind absolutely. that because of the kind of player pepe is and how effective he was for lille on those transitions when the ball breaks down in our half uh, or in you know your own half, and then you you unleash the speed and the dynamism of Pepe and and Aubameyang, and you've got Lacazette. Um, 
there as well, that there might be a temptation to slightly sit off and try and lure teams into a trap that you can then, uh, you know, uh, hit them with on the break or whatever. But I feel also like in order to do that properly, you have to be you have to be good defensively. So it would be kind of mad to do that with the players we have right now in defense. But, you know, we, we could play a, a 4-3-3 with the players that we've got and with the midfield options that we've got. And that's, that's an exciting thing. Um, I'm hopeful we'll move away pretty much altogether from the back three. Mm-hmm. So I am excited. Yeah, I, I, I am excited. And, and, you know, Pepe is a signing that puts bums on seats. And we want to see how he interacts with, with Lacazette and Aubameyang and maybe with Ozil in behind feeding him. You know, there, there are things to look forward to. At the same time, though, you know, it is a bit like walking across a rickety bridge and wondering, is one of these planks going to snap? And I'm going to fall into the river far below. That's the defensive side of things. But yeah, you know, I am excited and enthused. How can you not be about those things? It doesn't mean you're blind to the problems that we have. Um, I'm just hopeful that between now and Thursday, we can we can go some way to sorting those out. Uh, because if we do, you know, if you do bring in a good central defender, it, it makes everything feel an awful lot better. Hmm. I'm inclined to agree. I, I, I do feel optimistic. I think we're going to be fun to watch. Um, I just worry that we might be quite fun to watch for a neutral as well as an Arsenal <laughs> fan. Uh, let's have this question and uh, gauge your optimism on, on this subject. This is from Jude Sebastian on Facebook. And Jude says, final verdict on Ozil. Is he going to be a plus or minus for the club this coming season? And how many starts in the league do you think he'll have? Yeah, uh, good question. I had a similar question uh, from Twitter from Peter Lingland, who's at Peter Lingland, who says, besides a couple of promising performances in preseason, what, if anything, points in favour of Ozil having an assist king peak Real Madrid year season? Which is a good question. I think the the, the thing that strikes me most is um, the system and the formation. Mm-hmm. That if we are playing a back four, there's an easier way to get him into the team in a in a position which really suits him. Whereas for a lot of last season, we didn't do that. Um, and I think that was reflected in, in his performances. I hope as well that there is, from Ozil's point of view as well, a determination to to remind people of what a good player he can be. You know, it felt like everything yeah. got a bit on top of him last season and there was a lot to deal with after you know the World Cup and some personal issues we know there were problems with Unai Emery he appears to have have, have sorted those out to a certain extent and mended fences and you know I hope he's really up for it I hope he's really up for it and you know um, part of what could make him effective this season is his desire and his motivation to produce um, I guess that we are in a kind of hopeful situation though aren't we we are we are looking for him to to just pull the finger out a bit and do more than he did last season so i think those things you know maybe maybe his his pride is wounded but maybe if he if he sees a front three of players who are good to play with and good for him to play with and who can play to to some of his strengths like you know if you can if you can pick a defense apart with a pass but you don't have anyone making the runs for you to do that that's a different thing but when you've got Pepe Aubameyang Lacazette that must be fun if you're a playmaker looking at those three and thinking what you could provide for them well yeah certainly and i think if we you know if we do line up with this something like a 4231 with Ozil as the number 10 and and those players in front of him you know, there can't really be any excuses. I mean, that's an absolutely ideal setup for him. I have a slight worry that there's this constant expectation with Ozil that he will somehow return to his best. But in two months' time, he'll be 31. Mm. And I just wonder if he'll ever be the player that he was at, you know, 24, 25, 26. I think it's probably quite unlikely. It would be unlikely for almost any athlete. Um, but we would be better if he can get close to that level, uh, even close to it, you know, we would be a much improved team. So 
I hope that his attitude is right. I hope that he and the manager, the coach rather, uh, have a positive relationship this season and that mm. it doesn't become a distraction. That was my concern really about it last year. A lot of the time it felt like it was uh, a distraction and something that sort of weighed a bit heavy on the club financially and in terms of sort of how it dominated the, the news agenda. Uh, but it feels like a lot of that seems to have blown over and things feel positive. So, yeah, I'm really hoping we see a, a good season of Mesut Ozil. I'm, I'm hoping we see a good two seasons of Mesut Ozil yeah. because realistically it seems that he's going to be here. I guess some of the early games will be informative, won't they? Because yeah, we play away from home at Newcastle. Um, I was looking this up the other day. In in all the time he's been with us, he's he's only played in that game once at St. James's mm. Park. And that was last season and he scored. So hopefully he can do something similar. But we've got an away game at Anfield and we've got a home game against Tottenham at the end of August. Two really, really big fixtures. And how or if he's used in those games by Unai Emery will tell us a lot, I think. Yes, that's very good. I mean, would you hazard a guess? The question asks how many league starts he might get this season. How many did he start last season? I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. I mean, you could just... Uh, what is it? 19 game in a way. <laughs> About 19, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he does feel now. like a player who's more more suited to our home games than away games. It was but... 20 starts in the league last season for Mesut Ozil. I would say, geez, I don't know. It's so, it's so hard. Um, something similar? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think it'll be about the same. Mm. I think it'll be about the same. Uh, because, you know, you've got to bear in mind, there's Danny Ceballos available to us now. And, uh, you know, depending on what you believe, he's been given assurances that he'll get some playing time. Uh, and, you know, that will represent competition. And I just think away from home and in certain big matches, Emery's shown... He doesn't necessarily favour starting as also. Yeah, I think it'll. I think it'll be about half the games. Look, and I think one thing we should point out as well is that a lot of it is dependent on how well he plays. Like if he slots into you know the team and is is you know providing the bullets for our forwards, then it becomes much more difficult to leave him out for some of those away games, even if he doesn't necessarily suit them on paper. Mm. You know how a player's form uh, is can can really indicate or uh, inform the manager's selection decisions. So like, he, you know, if you're going to a tough away game where Ozil wouldn't normally play, but in the last, you know, three months, he's created 10 or 12 goals, then you have to think about that again, don't you? Of course, of course. And it might be that our attack, you know, ends up very reliant on him and, mm. you know, he becomes an integral part of the side. It's it's hard to predict because it feels like quite a different Arsenal team in some ways. If we're setting up with a back four, if we've got Pepe on the flank, if we've got some new faces in the middle of the park, it could feel quite different. It's, it's a curious thing because in some ways, a lot of the dead wood, not dead wood, a lot of the players who we thought might go at the end of last season haven't really left. Um, so we, we're left with a lot of the same faces. But despite that, I think we've managed to create slightly different feel to the team. So, mm. yeah, I'm really intrigued to see how that plays out. And the first few fixtures will be really instructive because we've got different types of tests early on. Yeah, yeah, OK. Here's one from Harper Pestinger at Pestinger Harper. Do you think Martinez will fully take over Czech's role and play not only in the early Europa League games, but also the later stages of that tournament and the Cups? Or is he not good enough to take up that position? I think he'll play the early stages and perhaps his performance in those early stages will inform whether he stays in the team in that competition. Mm. Um, personally, I'd, I'd use this opportunity to sort of slightly re-establish a hierarchy and make it clear that Leno is the first choice and will play like in a Europa League final or similar and, and have Martinez as a deputy who plays plenty of football around that. But yeah it seems slightly unlikely that Arsenal would adopt that policy having having not done so previously. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's the right way to go. I think, you know, when you get to... When you get the chance to win a European trophy, I think you play your number one goalkeeper. 
and mm-hmm. we talked about this last season. We could all understand why, to an extent, Emery chose Petr Cech, but I think you choose your best goalkeeper for a cup final. You know, Arsene Wenger did it by playing David Ospina in the FA Cup final against Chelsea, when at the time Cech was, you know, a better option than Ospina. Um, I think you kind of have to put sentiment to one side and do what the right thing for the team is. And if we get to a European final and Bernd Leno is by far our our number one goalkeeper, Bernd Leno plays in that game, regardless of what Martinez has done in the meantime, because the club winning the trophy is more important than rewarding the player. Mm. Seems a bit harsh, but, you know... And I don't think Czech, for example, was to blame for us losing the Europa League final, not by any means. But uh, I, I think I think we do have to, um, you know, in every other position, in every other position, you just pick your best player. Whereas goalkeeper has become a bit muddied over the years. Yeah, yeah. And I think... You know, there was a sort of greater sense of equality between Czech and Leno. I mean, Martinez definitely comes into this as an understudy, um, but it's still a promotion for him. So I hope they can sort of make him comfortable in that role, mm. uh, you know, with and, and keep him. Because by all accounts, he was great at Reading, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does in those cup games. But when it gets to the crunch, I want Leno in there. Because I've been impressed with Leno, actually, in pre-season. Yeah, me too. He's another one who... He looks really solid and looks sharp and he's growing into that role. He's got that number one shirt now and I'm expecting big things from him this year. Mm, okay. Uh, here's a question from Joe Hurst. We touched on captaincy in part one. Uh, this is on Facebook. And Joe says, why is Socrates always overlooked and never mentioned by anyone for the captaincy? Seems like a good option to me. Experienced, will more than likely play most games and has the right attitude. I guess, yeah. I mean, it does make some sense. Um, it's a good question, I think, yeah. Unless there's something about him or his character that we don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure Socrates is uh, fairly experienced. Is he, has he captained Greece? Has he? I'm not sure. Socrates, Quite possibly. Captain, uh, let's see. Maybe he has. Um, yeah, he's had a bit of a clash with the Greece manager, according to Google here. Um, Socrates, who captains his country. Um, so, yeah, why not? I don't know why there hasn't been any discussion of it. I mean, who do you think the five captains are going to be? Hmm, I think they're going to be Shaka. Uh, has he already said Mon- Ozil? Yes, I think he has. Ozil and Monreal, has he? Did he say Monreal? I'm not sure. Um, let me have a look at the squad I've done this before I, I think if for an English player if there is if there is going to be an English player I assume that'll be Rob Holding um, ba, 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 ba. Ozil Shaka they're all shouts yeah he's, he home. says uh, we're working now with the captains they are Shaka Ozil and Nacho Monreal I want to add two more and then I'm going to decide the number one two three four and five in the next five weeks so he's going to pick five captains then rank them in order of their <laughs> their captaincy juice how much captain juice they get each um, yeah so you've got two more to pick from well I guess I would have Socrates actually um, well as I'm... our as our sort of best central defender at this moment yeah. in time it would make a lot of sense and then I think I would go for I think I would go for Lacazette yeah as my fifth choice yeah I think so what about you well if he says he wants an English player yeah yeah then that can only be has to be holding or yeah. Joe Willock for captain obviously Joe Willock yeah for captain um, I you know I wouldn't uh I wouldn't necessarily rule out Hector as well as one of those players, but maybe coming back from injury, he doesn't need that distraction. But then Holding is coming back from injury as well. So Mm. um, maybe if he does give it to Holding, it'll tell us a bit about how he views Holding and his potential and and somebody who could become a first-team regular. But yeah, Socrates, I guess. Um, Yeah. 
It's not ideal, though, is it? No, I mean, Socrates, uh, the more I think about it, I'm like, why is he not talked up yeah. as a potential option? But there was a question here from Mark at Gunnar underscore Gawa, who says, is the five captains approach an acknowledgement that we don't have a clear leader in the squad who can command the position as their own? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, we haven't got a player who is, you know, clearly first choice, feels like they're here for the long term, uh, has the respect of everybody in the squad and is a sort of leader character. There's no there's no standout candidate for that. Mm. Um, and that's been a bit of a problem at Arsenal down the years. So we've often been in a situation where we've just sort of given the captaincy to the best player, which hasn't always worked out. Um, so, yes, I think that's uh, a bit of a, a bit of a problem. But... I'm hoping that this kind of shared responsibility will pan out. And there is at least going to be some sort of hierarchy in place. Emery has said he will name a number one captain, a number two captain, a number three, and so on. Yeah. Can I just answer my door, Andrew? Of course. It gives me a chance to play on this auspicious occasion the door answering music. Well, take it away. It was a false alarm. Someone had already gone. I got to the door and someone else was already there. Wow. Someone on but at least on your side of the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had crept to the door and answered it, unbeknownst to me. But okay. at least we got to play the music. Eh? We got to play the music. Was it anyone interesting on the other side of the door? Or was is that it not was, relevant? Um, Amazon Prime, actually. <laughs> <laughs> is that yeah. the brother of Optimus? Yes. <laughs> they've, done, they've done very well for, for themselves, those brothers. The, the, the Prime um, brothers have really... Uh, yeah, they own yeah, a Optimus lot of numbers. was killing it in the 80s and 90s, but Amazon, you know, it's a tortoise and hare situation. There. Yeah. Uh, well, I believe they own a lot of numbers as well. Mm. But Optimus pays his taxes, apparently. So well, that's good, yeah. He's got that going for him. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, I'm sagging them off, but I am... A customer, clearly. So clearly, I can't be too. You're critical. enabling there. Um. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, right, shall I have a look for another question? Yeah, why not? Here's just a quick uh, one. Oh no, on. do I have one? Um, I've got one. If not, yeah, go go for it. So this is from Gunner Pride, uh, and Gunner Pride says on Twitter, "Why do you think the club have not made an official announcement on the promotion of the Arsenal youngsters to the first team?" or even their shirt number changes? No idea. Mm. Genuinely, I don't know. I wonder if it's... I wonder if it's just because they, they think maybe they're not all going to be part of the squad next season and they're waiting to, to see how it all shakes out in terms of incoming transfers and loans out loans. before they say, yeah, this is the, these are the guys who are going to be with us. That's true, because, you know, we talk about having... Aubameyang, Lacazette, Pepe, but then who are the other? Who are the players who have re- really stood out? The young players who stood out this year, Saka, uh, or in preseason rather, Saka and Kedia, John Jules, mm. Reese Nelson. You know, uh, Joe Willock. Obviously, there there isn't room for all of them in the first team no. squad. So no. one or two will probably play somewhere else next season, go on loan or something like that. I mean, I, I do think there's football there for them particularly with the Europa League, um, which I really, really, really hope we use for uh, for the young players. Hmm. But yeah, it could well be a case that they're waiting until the transfer window closes before they finalise the squad and, and everything else. Yeah, I feel like in an ideal world, we would have sold more players. In an ideal world... We would have sold Mustafi, El Neni, Mkhitaryan, you know, maybe one more. And that mm. might have created some opportunities, some space in the squad for these young players. As it stands, we've got a fairly decent sized squad. And, you know, part of the responsibility of Per Mertzaka, Edu, Freddie Jumberg, I think is to sort of make decisions 
on which of these young players are going to be per- part of the first team this year and which would be better served by going out and being on loan. Mm. There's no point in us keeping someone around so they can play a bunch of under-23 games which don't really test them and don't really develop them. Yeah, you know, They need to, to get out and play football if their path to the first team is going to be blocked. And definitely some will go. My hunch is still very strongly that Emil Smith-Rowe will go out on loan. Mm. Um, Gosh, we didn't even mention him, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I think that tells you that that's almost certainly what yeah, he's going to end up. I saw a story today, Darren Arsenal on Twitter saying that Swansea um, are very keen to take Eddie and Ketia, which doesn't surprise me because I know that Swansea have got a few potential loans of young players lined up for you know the end of the transfer window. It's quite common for championship clubs. They sort of will speak to clubs and say, look, if you decide to let so-and-so go, you know, we're there to take him because yeah. that's going to happen with a number of young players what, in the Premier League. What would you do with Eddie and Kedia? It's tricky, you know, because you've got Lacazette and you've got Aubameyang. You've got Nicolas Pepe as well, who I think can at a push play through the middle. But he's one I would keep, I think. I originally said send him out on loan in the last season. I was like, he needs the football, but... I can see us playing a first team quite regularly that incorporates all of Lacazette, Aubameyang and Pepe. And if you do that, mm. you, you need a forward on the bench. And yeah. that would be Eddie and Ketia. Yeah, and what happens if one of them gets an injury or a suspension? Yeah. You know, I, I would certainly keep Nketiah until January at least. And I would I play do. him I would play him as the centre forward in every single Europa League group game. Absolutely, because, you know, he can play out wide, but you'd have to say, when you look at our strikers, Aubameyang's better suited to it than him. Pepe mm. certainly is better suited to it than him. And I think he's earned that opportunity. He scored goals in pre-season. Yeah, I think he's added quite a lot to his game. You know, he always we always thought of him as a very good finisher, but I think in pre-season, we've seen more of an all-round striker's game from Nketiah. Um And I think he needs that chance. He needs it in the, the League Cup and the Europa League. Those matches should be his. So, yeah, he, he's one I would definitely, definitely keep around. I think the yeah. question marks are more over, say, a Reese Nelson, potentially, mm. or, um, or, or a Saka. You know, it, I find it hard to see both those players getting the game time they deserve. Yeah. I think the thing about Saka is he's 17. He's, only, he's still only 17. So a season at under 23 level, even though he looks ready, in my opinion, he looks ready for some first-team football, not necessarily a, a, a full season. I have a question here for for you from John Craven, um, who used to have a very popular news round show. Uh, thanks for listening, John. <laughs> he is at underscore JRC1992. He says, have you been disappointed with Reese Nelson in preseason? I know it's fairly uncompetitive, but all our other youngsters have really shone where, while I feel he's looked quite toothless. Um were you expecting a bit more from Reese Nelson during preseason? Um, maybe a little, but I have to say I think he's been a little bit hard done by with some of the comments I've read about him. I mean, every time I watch him, I do think clearly this guy is very technically accomplished, uh, and I think there is an intelligence in his game as well. I feel like he's not particularly wasteful. He ends up looking a little bit uh, like a sort of continuity guy rather than something special but I think it's in there I really do think it's in there and I think I also think there's a bit of a misconception about what he is I think he's often described as a winger uh, when I have seen Reese Nelson play with the under 23s at his best he, that's not really been what he's offered he's been more of a, a second striker or a, a number 10 you know someone who's scoring goals creating chances in central areas so or, or, or maybe cutting inside off the left flank mm. I, I, I don't think he's set the world alight but I still think there's huge talent there and I think we would be I think we'd be remiss to just you know write write that off. I'm not suggesting anyone's doing that, but if you look at what he did at Hoffenheim, when the chances came to him in the final third, the opportunities to make an impact, to show a bit of killer instinct and a bit of composure, he generally did do that. And actually if it was a Premier League match and a chance fell to Reese Nelson, I would feel pretty confident in his technique, in his state of mind, in him being able to do that. And I, I think he will have, if he stays at Arsenal and gets game time, I think he will have big moments this season. What, what have you made of him? I feel 
quite similar to you in that I can see the talent and I can see the potential, but there's just something n- not quite there mm. yet. Yet is the key word here. I can sort of see why he wasn't starting as often at Hoffenheim as people would have hoped. There's just something in his decision making which isn't quite quite where it needs to be at this moment in time because he's got fantastic ability on the ball. He can run with it. He can beat people. He's strong. He can finish, as we've seen. But just when it comes to making the decision at the right time, I feel like there's some work that still needs to be done there. And that's why I've, I, I just feel, I don't know, again, maybe Europa League football games will help. Play him. You know, the same with Enkedia. Play him. Let him play for Arsenal for six months, even if it is only 10 games or 12 games um, between the Europa League and the League Cup and, and whatever else. But surely that gives us a better way of assessing his ability than sending him out on loan and watching from afar. Like, I feel like with Enkedia, let's give him a chance to do what he mm. can do. And if it's not working out by January, you've got the loan market. And you can send him out and you can you can hope he develops somewhere else. But yeah, I, I think other young players have stood out more for me during preseason, which isn't to say I think Nelson has been bad. I just think some of the others have been better. And, you know, based on that... Uh, I think we need to give him a run in the team in the games where we can afford to do that. And he could still be a, a useful substitute in the Premier League as well. So, Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I still have really high hopes for Reese Nelson, uh, despite uh, a slightly inauspicious pre-season. Mm. Um, how are we doing on questions? You got any more left? Mm, not really, but given, given who we're playing on Sunday, I just have to mention this one. It comes from... <laughs> You know what it's going to be about, of course. Yeah. Liam course. Arnold, who's at Liam343. We play the Magpies this weekend. How worried should we should we be? And what are your predictions? It's Magpies. <sighs> it's the Magpies showdown. The Magpie derby. Um, how worried should we be? I mean, I think we've got to go to Steve Bruce's Newcastle and think we can win that game. <laughs> yeah. Surely. Yeah. They've not had a good preseason, really. Uh, they've lost Salomon Rondon. They've lost uh, Iosi Perez. You know, I think they've got one striker on the books last time I checked, and it's Dwight Gale. Oh, maybe they've added the Brazilian actually since then, mm. uh, whose name I forget, Joe Elson, something like that. But um, they're, they're, anyway, Newcastle fans aren't particularly enthused with what's going on there. Uh, Steve Bruce is a pretty uninspiring appointment and the fans aren't particularly happy so it's not as if we'll face a a St James's Park where they'll necessarily be riled up for the occasion Mm. I think we've got to go there and win and I think I'm going to say we will I'm going to say Arsenal will win that match 2-1 2-1 no clean sheet of course no clean sheet I'm (laughs) realistic I'm not crazy um and yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's the, this week's magpie fact that the magpies will lose two one. Okay, guess. that's a good fact. Hopefully, it is a fact. If let's <laughs> just let's just um, do this very quickly. I think even if we do sign somebody this week, it might be a case that the Newcastle game comes too soon. So if we bring in a central defender from wherever we bring them in, it might well be a case that the 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 game comes a bit too quickly for them. So mm-hmm. based on that. What sort of a, you know, and based on who we have available, Here we go. What, what sort of a starting 11 do you think we'll see? So, I mean, I think I think the back four will be Maitland-Niles, Chambers, Socrates, and Monreal. We've got Jacques Chambers, in midfield. Chambers, Socrates, Maitland-Niles, Monreal. Yeah, I mean, it's not inspiring, is it? As a no, metaphor. it's not. Um, midfield, I think we'll see Jacques Genduzzi. And Joe Willock. Do you now? Yeah. Because I don't think we're going to see Pepe. Oh, no. For the Newcastle game, because he's only just come back from his holidays and he does need to get fitness in. And then I think we're going to see Ozil, Aubameyang, Lacazette. I think, uh, assuming Lacazette makes it, because he's got an injury. What kind of, uh, with Ozil from the right and Aubameyang from the left? Maybe we could play a four... 
three four one diamond. two or four diamond two. I think that we'll see. I mean, do you I'm think there'll be just, anything different in that team? I think Mkhitaryan might play. Oh. <laughs> I just know that Unai Emery likes him, doesn't he? And I think if he's going to go with the four two three one, then he might go with mm. Aubameyang and Mkhitaryan in the wider areas, say, and then um, and then as a, it can play centrally as a ten behind Lacazette. I, I think Shaka will play, and I think Joe Willock might start alongside him ahead of Gunduzi. I just right. think in terms of being fresh and ready, he's played so much a pre-season. I, I think he might get the nod. OK. Well, we don't have too long to wait. The Premier League season kicks off on Sunday against Newcastle. We, we will be doing all the stuff we normally do uh, for Premier League and all the other games. There'll be a live blog, there'll be match report, there'll be player ratings, which reminds me I've got to get the new players added to the player rating system. Uh, make a note of that. Uh, email Alex to do that. Sorry, I'm doing it live on air. Um, and uh, this week we will have, of course, some uh, some podcasts for you looking ahead to the new season. We're going to do a season preview one after the window closes. And as is tradition, I will be chatting to Ken Early of Second Captains for more broad football chat about the uh, the start of the new season and what we can expect from that. So you've got all that to come this week and James, you and I will be here next Monday to talk about the first Premier League game of the season in Arscast Extra 301. Exciting. Wow. 301 not out. Look forward to it. Let's hope the uh, the rest of the transfer window brings us, well, well I was going to say good news, but brings us a centre half. Really. Yes. A centre half. Good news we don't need, but a centre half uh, would be good news, but we need the centre half first and foremost. So look, thank you as ever for listening. Thank you for supporting us in all the ways that you do. We really do appreciate it. We will catch you on the next one. Until then. Bye-bye. 